Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Joining me for a very special interlude is Jungian analyst and author, Dr. Murray Stein in Zurich, Switzerland. He holds a Master of Divinity from Yale University and a PhD in Religion and Psychological Studies from the University of Chicago. He trained as a Jungian analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich and later co-founded the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago, where he worked as a training analyst. Dr. Stein served as president of the International Association for Analytical Psychology, as well as the International School of Analytical Psychology, known as ISAP Zurich, where he is currently a training and supervising analyst. He is the author of many books and articles, and is the co-founder and publisher emeritus of Chiron Publications, the first volume of his collected writings, titled Individuation, is available now. Dr. Stein's book, Jung's Map of the Soul, inspired BTS's 2019 album, the multi-award winning Map of the Soul Persona. Its long-awaited follow-up, Map of the Soul 7, was announced on January 7th and is scheduled to be released in four phases, beginning this week with the comeback trailer Interlude Shadow. Dr. Stein is here today to look at it from a Jungian perspective and to discuss Jung's concept of the shadow and how it relates to the persona and the ego. This interview was recorded on Saturday, January 11th, 2020, through the magic of Skype. Dr. Stein, what is Jung's concept of the shadow and how does it relate to the persona? The persona is the face we have to other people. We face out to the world around us, our social self. It's what we show to other people. It's the face to meet the faces. That's the persona. Mm -hmm. And that shifts and changes depending on who we're with. If you're with an intimate friend, you have a more intimate persona. If you're with, in a formal situation, you have a more formal persona. So the persona is um, um, uh, various. We have many selves in that sense. Okay, it's, it's kind of a subtle change. And you notice that in your friends when they're talking to certain people, they'll be one kind of personality when they talk to you, they're another kind, and so on and so forth. The shadow is the part of ourselves that we hide. We don't show that. We even hide it from ourselves. So it's like what's locked away in the closet or in a secret room or in the basement. It's a part of ourselves that we aren't proud of, that we uh, might feel shame if other people saw us, uh, people who don't know us well, that we don't trust, we don't know uh, intimately, and they would catch us out in a shadow enactment doing something that isn't consistent, let's say, with our best self uh, presentation. And so the shadow is the part of ourselves that we don't like. And at its deepest level, it has to do with bad things. It has to do with evil. It has to do with the seven deadly sins, you know, greed, lust, pride, all those kinds of things uh, that um, we'd rather not uh, see ourselves in that light. So becoming aware of the shadow is a very difficult moral problem because we have to face ourselves. And that's not a pleasant thing when we look at ourselves through the lens of the shadow. I also think of the shadow as something that I don't think I am. So when maybe somebody sees something about me that I don't see, and I think I'm not that, that's my cue that that's in my shadow. So now is the shadow unconscious? Because if I have an awareness that this is something that I am, and I don't want anybody to know, it's not in the unconscious. So is that still the shadow? Well, there are levels of shadow. Um, There are parts of the shadow that you can get a hold of uh, by reflection, just reflecting on yourself, introspecting, being honest with yourself. And there are parts of your shadow that are quite deeply repressed that that it's almost impossible to see because it is so much in the unconscious or as we say behind your back it's hard to see your back 
So you ask your, your partner, your husband, your wife, your intimate friends to give you some feedback on that. That's one way to get a hold of that. Or we also project the shadow. What, what's unconscious, we tend to discover outside ourselves and other people. Um, so look at your enemies, look at the people you really don't like, look at the qualities in those people that you don't like, and then see if you can find any hint of that in yourself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can by, for instance, looking at your dreams, you find characters in your dreams that are similar to that. And um, uh, then you ask yourself, well, is that a part of me? That's the beginning of uh, delving into or exploring the world of the shadow. And the shadow is not just personal, it's also collective. It's in politics, it's in uh, affairs between nations, and uh, when they fall into warfare, they project the shadow onto the other. The other one's always evil and bad, we're always good. God's on our side, the devil's on their side. So we tend to split and polarize the world that way. And uh, the world that's evil and bad, if you look at it, um, you say that's the shadow world. But it's also a part of us, which is actually um, one of the realizations in this uh, song, Interlude Shadow, that uh, BTS has just produced. There is a recognition that the shadow is a part of ourselves, even though we want to disown it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, it was just released this week, and it's three minutes long. It features one member, Suga, and he is... Wow, it's it, it's intense. And I had some people write to me right afterwards saying they were scared. And I think it rattled a lot of people. Um, would you say a little bit about the kind of the the intensity, um, the hostility that that is embodied in, in, in the images in that video? Now, intense is a good word, um, because the emotion is intense. Um, uh, when you get into the into the realm of shadow, it tends to become very emotional. When we touch on shadow, mm -hmm. whether it's a projection or, or in ourselves, we become um, uh, highly charged emotionally. It's a very, very emotional territory. And in that uh, three-minute film, you can see the intensity coming out, both in what Suga says, uh, what he uh, affirms, uh, in his fear and anxiety, and of course, in the background, the, the shadow figures about to pounce on him, about to grab him. Um, there is a, a shattering uh, of glass and mirrors and uh, all of that, because it is a shattering experience. Jung said, we face the shadow, it is a shattering experience. It shatters our self-image. It shatters our confidence. Uh, we ask ourselves, uh, who are we? Uh, uh, and so lots of questions are raised, and they're very emotional. And that comes across very strongly uh, in that film. So what is the shadow's relation to the ego? How, how does that work? The shadow is the um, hidden part of the ego. You know, the ego is the I. Uh, when Suga sings, I want to be a rap star. I want to be the top. I want to be a rock star. I want all mine. That I, 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 that's the ego speaking. Okay. Okay. Um, anytime you use the word I, uh, you're, you're referencing your ego. When you look out at the world and you approach other people as an individual, it's, uh, and you're interacting with them, uh, the ego is involved. Now, other parts of the personality are also involved, but the ego is the core, the center of uh, consciousness. Now, at, there is a hidden part of the ego, uh, and that's what we call the shadow. The shadow is our um, coldest egotism, you could say, our most selfish self. Uh, that's the core of the shadow, and Jung says, you know, there are aspects of this that one can discover and it isn't so shattering, but he says it's a rare person who has ever faced absolute evil. And um, that is a totally shattering experience. If you ever come across such a person mm -hmm. uh, represents absolute evil, 
you will shun them. You you get the chills. It's very cold. Uh, so representations of the shadow in literature and film, and so on. These are very um, dark figures. You know the the opposite, the enemy of the good. And um, but that is uh, the, the ego is not exempt from that. The ego. Um, uh, uh, can can stay away from it, can can avoid it, should be aware of it. The ego is our conscious self, uh, but sometimes it gets trapped in it, and sometimes it gets lost in it. Sometimes it gets possessed by that, those uh, kinds of motives. And so um, just having an ego is um, a part of human nature. We all have it, uh, and we all have the capacity for evil and for selfishness. We also have the capacity for love, and um, uh, love, which uh, BTS has sung a lot about, um, uh, is not, does not belong to the realm of the shadow. The shadow is the absence of love. The deadly sins are bad love, or uh, the uh, the uh, neglect of love, the absence of love. Um, love reaches out to others. Shadow wants to control them. And the ego has both of these aspects available to it. And so now what is the difference between the ego and the persona? Uh, the persona uh, represents the ego, uh, represents the individual in a socially acceptable way. Uh, when you speak uh, in the persona, as we say, um, it's the ego speaking, but it's speaking in a uh, you could say in a key or in a in an image um, that is socially adapted and socially acceptable. When the ego is in a shadow position uh, or is taken over by the shadow, uh, it's not generally socially acceptable. In fact, people will shun it. Um, some people may gravitate towards it if they can relate to it, if they see that's... Uh, that's part of their shadow too, and this happens in politics. When a shadow politician comes along, people—it's um, like a, an accumulation of shadow energies uh, that gathers around this figure, and they can become politically very powerful because mm -hmm. they enact the shadow that's resident in the collective psyche. Um, uh, and then the uh, people who don't support that or see it as shadow, fear it, will stay away from it, or fight it or um, try to keep it from dominating the, um, the collective world. And it sure does get a lot of attention and a lot of emotion stirred up in people, as do the movies. And I do know that these types of dark figures and dark themes are very, very popular in yes. our culture. Um, and why is that? Well, there's a fascination with it. And by going to a movie that um, uh, that uh, embodies uh, the uh, shadow energies, you participate in the uh, in the shadow behavior and enactments vicariously, mm -hmm. um, and it's a way of uh, uh, releasing your shadow in a fairly safe way. Uh, usually, it's fairly safe unless the film. Uh, energizes the shadow to such an extent that people start acting and behaving uh, in the ways that the shadow character in the film does. But for most people, it's a kind of release. Um, it, it lets a little of the steam out. You know, we try to be so good. Young one said, it's unhealthy to be too good, you know, because we're, we're keeping a part of ourselves too much back and too much in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, and too repressed, and so that backfires on us. We enter into neuroses and inner conflicts that are very hard to understand. So uh, what therapy tries to do is find a way of um, releasing some of that energy, integrating some of that energy mm -hmm. into ego functioning so that uh, it's not all bottled up inside of us. So it isn't bad that these films are, are shown and that people go to them. It kind of takes care of some of that energy. Same thing with very aggressive sports. Um, you know, you're a sports fan, Laura. You go to Bears games. You cheer for your side. Um, and, um, uh, and and they're very aggressive and physical and, and bordering on brutality. And, yes. uh, 
Uh, and it's a release for that kind of energy. The fans are in there with the players uh, vicariously, and it, uh, it has a, um, a kind of uh, ameliorative effect uh, on the public. The games are good. It's, it's a way of, and, and there are rules to the game, so it's not all-out warfare. Mm -hmm. um, all-out warfare is the shadow and the loose. I mean, it has been released from its captivity and it's uh, rampant in the world and total war which is what hitler uh practiced total war means total destruction um you hold nothing back in the shadow as, as the uh, last say on everything so it's possible for us to become possessed by the shadow yes uh absolutely uh and how do we how do we prevent that <laughs> Well, consciousness, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's the value of a song like this, Interlude Shadow. It, it's a song about becoming conscious, not of terribly dark features of the shadow. I must say these are relatively mild, but uh, they're very honest and very straightforward yeah. and aware of those things. And then to um, uh, dialogue with them, uh, which happens in the last part of this song. There's a dialogue or conversation of sorts between the shadow figure and the ego figure, the singer, Suga. Um, that was Jung's answer to it. Um, for instance, in, in Jung's um, famous Red Book experiences, uh, there's a lot of dialoguing with uh, figures of the unconscious, and among those are shadow figures. Even the devil appears. Um, and um, it, it, it's a way of becoming familiar with um those energies by imaging them and uh, uh, entering into a kind of uh, dialogical uh, relationship with them, becoming familiar, and to some extent draining their energy or by bringing them into a relationship with the ego, uh, with consciousness, um, it, um, it uh, changes uh, what we call the opposites into polarities. The opposites are splitting, they are divided. There is no, there is no bridge between them. They, it's a win or, winner or loser situation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can change the opposites into polarities, you can have a dynamic movement between them, like yin and yang. You have dark and you have light. They can work against each other, they can work with each other, but they don't split into opposites. So that's the value of dialoguing and self-knowledge, um, that you can, to some extent at least, avoid the splitting phenomenon that uh, is so prevalent when, when the shadow takes over uh, or takes possession, then um, you know, you're either on my side or you're against me. Um, it's that kind of a phenomenon. It's a splitting of the world and of relationships. So let's talk a little bit more about this song and the imagery in the music video. When I was watching it, I was thinking about when I was in analysis and I would have a dream and my analyst would encourage me sometimes to, if I, if I was struggling with it, she would suggest that I draw it or paint it or sculpt it and, you know, work with the images. And I thought about that when I watched this video, um, because of the door and the red blobs around the door. It's very, it, 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 it kind of doesn't make sense. So it reminded me of a dream. And I was wondering what your thoughts were about the red. Well, red is a very um, vibrant color. It's the color of blood. It's the color of life. But it's also the color of, you know, very strong emotional energy. It would be anger. Um but that opening scene is, uh, I think, very striking because you see Suga uh, in that hallway with that red door, doorway in, in, behind him, and then a bunch of men standing at their doors, each one isolated. There is no relationship among them. Mm. Um, and, um, so, and Suga is the only singer, uh, performer in this, uh, in this song. So that's very important, this... this um, uh, isolation of the individual from relationships to the other uh, figures around them. Um, uh, that's 
a, a feature of um, the shadow uh, because it isolates. There, there's a Gnostic myth, um, uh, and the main figure in it is called Yaldabaoth. He's a creator god. And that this creator god is different from all the other creator gods in that he creates alone. All the other gods and the, and the other events of creation in this myth create as pairs, as couples. There's a masculine, a feminine aspect to it. A male and a female god create together. He comes along and he creates the world alone. And it is the evil world. It's the dark world. It's the world that we know when we look through the eyes of, of our, uh, our shadow awareness and we see the world as a very ugly, uh, very uh, violent, very uh, distasteful and um, um, almost uninhabitable place. That's a Gnostic world. Uh, it's a rejection. It's a, it's a sense that we should reject this world. That's what Yaldabaoth creates. And this um, isolated, lonely God figure creating all by himself, outside of any relationship, um, is a, a symbol of the type of world that the shadow would create. When you, and when you read these lines, I want to be rich. I want to be the king. I want it all mine. I want to be me. I want a big thing. All of that. I want it all mine. That kind of greed. Yeah. Um, you see, that's the shadow speaking uh, through the ego. It's the I speaking, and the shadow is speaking through him. Um, and uh, and you see him all alone. He dances all alone. He goes through all his the whole film alone. Um, and um, and then he experiences a great deal of anxiety and fear because he sees. Uh, what a dangerous position he's fallen into, mm -hmm. being isolated. Um, and he experiences a lot of anxiety um, because he um, now experiences the opposites. Uh, as dark as the light's intense, uh, the, the, uh, the brighter it gets, the darker the dark gets. Uh, the higher you go, uh, the lower the ground is. And uh, so there's a fear of falling off of this uh, position by overreaching, getting there too fast at the expense of everybody else. Uh, you know, that it's one figure singing. There are seven of them. And the, uh, the album is going to be called Map of the Soul Seven. So one assumes that that has something to do with the seven singers, the seven performers. But here he's all alone. He's speaking as an isolated individual. And that feeling of isolation and the anxiety that comes with it and the loneliness that comes with it and the fear of falling from that position uh, is very much a part of this story. And then he prays that uh, uh, he, won't, uh, uh, he won't have to fly. He'll be able to hold his position or come down and <laughs> soft landing. Um, um, but there is a, a tremendous amount of anxiety at this act of hubris, what the Greeks called hubris, was um, reaching beyond, uh, uh, reaching for more than was um, humanly appropriate. If you reach too far, the gods will punish you. And there is that feeling among many people, it's like a fear of too much success. Mm -hmm. You rise too fast and you realize uh, this is a dangerous thing because you're making a lot of enemies as you go up. Um, and they will uh, be envious of you and they will try to bring you down. So there's a normal anxiety about uh, being successful um, and too successful too fast. Uh, we call that hubris. Or the Greeks called that hubris. It's a kind of pride that sets in and one thinks one's godlike. And that's a very dangerous position. Well, when I watch this and and I saw the lyrics in English, and for everybody watching the video on YouTube, you can turn on the closed captions and English is available. So this was very kind of opposite to my experience of BTS because Map of the Soul Persona was the first album of theirs um, that was my introduction to them. And I did attend their concert in Chicago and it was all very positive and loving. And I watched their BTS run series and Bon Voyage and their 
quote unquote good guys, right? They're sweet and they're kind and they're beautiful. And then to see Suga in this video saying things like, you know, I want to be a rock star. I want to be rich. Right away, I thought there's the shadow. Exactly. It's a confession. We haven't spoken about the lyrics at the end of the song, which I thought were interesting when he says, and this is an, this lyric is in another BTS song, I'm you and you're me. And when we were talking about the shadow on a previous episode about politics, um, we were talking about seeing things in other people that we despised or we criticized them for or we hated or we wanted them punished. And we talked about asking, like you said in the beginning, where is that in me? So would you talk a little bit about the lyrics at the end of the song, I'm you, you're me, now do you know? Yes, well, I've got, uh, I I think that's uh, a a complex um, part of the the lyrics. I I was very intrigued by it. And I see it as a dialogue of acceptance. Uh, I see it as a dialogue because there's an I and a you now. He's not alone. And who is speaking? And I thought, is that the shadow speaking to him or is he speaking to the shadow? And you could take it either way uh, when he says, yeah, I'm you, you are me. Now do you know, yeah, you are me, um, and so on and so forth. It could be the shadow speaking to, to the ego, the shadow speaking to Suga, uh, and saying, we are one, do you get it? You can't get rid of me, we are connected. You, we will always be together. We are one body and we are gonna clash. Yeah. We, are, we are me, this do you know. And so that, that's a kind of integration of acceptance of um, the shadow, you can't get rid of it. It will always be there. You know, if you're in the world and you're working hard and you want to rise, you're ambitious, um, and there's going to be a shadow aspect to that. There will be moments when you take decisions that are shadowy you, to, to put yourself ahead of somebody else, to uh, stab them in the back, to um, uh, Uh, do things that are not quite correct or even legal or ethical, you know, pushing ahead and you do it semi-consciously or unconsciously. uh, And you can't get away from it. If you live in the world, you're going to uh, be uh, subject to shadow enactments. And this is a a deep recognition uh, that we can't get away from the shadow. Nobody is free of the shadow. And... um, that's in an introverted sense of uh, an uh, uh, introverted interpretation. On the extroverted side, um, yes, the way you say it, uh, and uh, Laura, you, the um, the uh, recognition that the, the despised uh, and the despised aspects of uh, the people around you that you want to reject or you 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 think are uh, terrible or ugly or something. Um, are also uh, a part of you, and you can relate to that. That gives you a kind of, uh, if not empathy, at least understanding that nobody's perfect, and we're we're all in this together. And um, we can relate to each other even though we aren't perfect. Um, uh, There is a deep bond of um, kinship uh, uh, between all of us, among all of us. Mm and so that overcomes the divides on the extroverted side. It's recognition and acceptance of the shadow aspects that we project into other people like criminals or refugees, migrants, all those people that we want to keep out and keep away. And on the introverted side, it's recognition and acceptance that our own shadow will always be with us. And we need to keep stay aware of that. Do you get it? He says, we are one body. Uh, this do you know? I don't know if that's a good translation, but do you know this? Get it. Uh, and sometimes we will clash. So sometimes there's parts of me that I don't like, and I want things that the other part of me or another part of me doesn't want to want. So there's that inner struggle and that clashing. And so 
that's natural. We all have it. And the key is to me to work on it. And like you said, bring awareness around it. So what are some of the things we can do? How can we express the shadow in a healthy way or integrate it and not be afraid of it? Because I've been getting asked this a lot on Twitter. You know, what do we do with this? Well, um, one thing is to try not to be too good, okay? To yeah. be too perfect. That, that's a trap. It's, it's fine to want to be a good person. We should all strive to be good people and to love everybody. But we also should recognize that we can't. And, um, uh, and watch ourselves because um, if we try too hard, we will either hurt them unconsciously, others, or we'll hurt ourselves unconsciously. So to be aware that we aren't perfect, um, I think is a very important uh, point that we, and that we're complex and that we have different sides. And to accept that, you know, if you're in a bad mood, you hate everybody. <laughs> For a little while, you hate everybody. Right. Your mood, you love everybody. Uh, this is normal. Our emotions fluctuate. Um, and if one can contain all of that um, and reflect on it and hold it, I think that's a, a, a great step forward. And to, um, to move a little more slowly, maybe. Um, you know, what happens in this song is he, there are these tremendous affirmations at the beginning. I want, I want, I want. And then there's a kind of break and then the fear sets in. And uh, the fear and the anxiety and the um, realization that um, uh, one might have to pay a big price for these things, to use that, to use that fear to um, kind of bring oneself back closer to uh, who, other parts of ourselves uh, to, you know, there's the story of Icarus uh, who flies too high and crashes. His father, Daedalus, he and his father are in a labyrinth. They're trapped and they want to get out of this labyrinth. And his father makes wings for him and wings for himself. And they both fly out. And the father flies at a moderate height and gets out of the labyrinth, can fly out and land outside. The son gets all thrilled with the power he has in his hands, uh, on, his, on his arms, and he flaps his wings too hot, hard, and he flies too high, and the sun melts the wax on his wings, and he crashes to his death. So um, fear of flying is, is not a bad thing. Uh, fear of flying too high, use your fears and use your anxieties to become uh, conscious of dangers. We have these anxieties for a reason. Um, and um, uh, I guess to um, be uh, to watch oneself, to look in the mirror, to think about oneself uh, carefully and reflect and ask other people, take, take their comments, even if they're hurtful comments, yeah. in and let them and reflect on them and see, well, maybe they're projecting, maybe they're totally off the wall, maybe they're, you know, just envious and hate me, but mm -hmm. still seeing something uh, that I need to become aware of. Right. And so ask the questions of yourself. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. The title of this trailer is Interlude Shadow. That title intrigued me. Um, why did they use the word interlude? And, and where does this belong in the context of the whole album it was my question mm -hmm. interlude is a uh, a moment of stopping uh you know it's an in-between time uh you stop uh, it's like an intermission you know you go to uh, the opera stops at the intermission or the or the or the play and you go out and you talk to somebody a bit and you reflect on what you've mm -hmm. seen right uh, think things over a bit and then you go back into it so this belongs to a whole. We don't know what comes before it, and we don't know what comes after it. It's an interlude. So it's it's intriguing to, to think about what will precede this song and what will follow this song, uh, if this is an interlude. Mm -hmm. now, we know that the album will be about shadow and ego, um, but there's gonna, they're going to say more about the shadow, certainly, and they're going to say more about the ego, and they're going to sing... Um, uh, a number of probably seven or eight songs, I would think, in total. And maybe this will 
go in the middle. It's an interlude. So anyway, that was a, a question I had, and it makes me wonder what's coming after this. What's coming after this? And um, the next album called Map of the Soul 7 is to be released in four phases. Um, the record label Big Hit released a comeback map. And what's next is the first single will be released on January 17th, followed by, interestingly enough, February 3rd, another comeback trailer titled Ego. And I was thinking about ego while you were talking and how it kind of has a negative connotation in our culture that, you know, he has a big ego or this is all ego. And Jung didn't use the term ego that way. Uh, I think you, you did discuss the difference between ego and persona. And also about shadow integration, I kind of wanted to mention ego strength. And it can be quite overwhelming. And I, I hope that people don't watch this video and think that they need to, you know, run to a mirror and look at themselves and just think about all the things about themselves that are, you know, shadow like and get completely overwhelmed by it. Um, we need a strong ego to face our shadow. Isn't that true? Yes. Uh, the word ego is, um, you know, a Latin word. It means I. And when um, Jung and Freud, Freud began this uh, uh, tradition of um, using the word I, the I and the, and the id, as he called it, the it or the unconscious. Um, when, that, when they used this word in German, they simply used the word ich. Mm -hmm. Ich, das Ich, the I. When it was translated into English, um, a translator named Strachey, um, uh, in, a British translator of Freud's works, wanted to make it sound, wanted to make the terminology sound more scientific and medical and so on. And so he used Latin words for like ego, super ego, so on and so forth. It isn't, it isn't in line with the tone. Um, of discourse in the German. So when Freud and Jung were using ego, uh, ich, das ich, it's simply the I. But it's a little hard to, to use it that way in English. The I sounds funny. But that's what it is. It's, uh, it's the I-ness of you. Uh, and um, you have this from the very moment of your birth. It, it's latently there. You you're, you come out of the birth canal, you open your eyes, you look around, you hear, see things, there's an eye there. There's a Something is registering that. And that eye grows and develops in the course of a lifetime. And when you talk about a strong ego, uh, that's something that comes into being over the course of, of years. Uh, uh, the capacity to withstand setbacks, to take, uh, to, to go through difficult situations without breaking down to, um, to survive disappointments, losses, uh, all of that indicates a strong ego. And to be able to do that, um, uh, it's necessary to um, put this factor in ourselves through a number of rather rigorous trials, um, like initiation trials, that um, when you go to school, you know, and you're given a grade, I remember when I was in college, the first grade I got was a very bad one. I was shocked and surprised. Mm -hmm. Well, I could have gone home and said, I, I just can't do this. But instead, I, I said, well, I'll try to do better than the next one. And gradually, over the course of the semester, my grades improved quite well. So you, you take the setbacks, you take the blow. If it isn't too traumatic, you can use it. Um, and you use, it strengthens the ego. It toughens the ego. And a strong ego has the capacity to contain, uh, to contain feelings, emotions, disappointments, um, the hardships of life, um, and including the recognition that one isn't perfect, that one, uh, you know, one's personality has good points and not so good points. We have strengths, we have weaknesses. That capacity to contain the complexity of ourselves 
and of the world around us, that indicates a strong ego. And a strong ego is extremely valuable, A, for survival in the world. Uh, individuals have to survive in the social world, in the material world, and for contributing. Uh, if you break down uh, um, with emotion um, uh, for whatever reason, you can't contribute anything. You have to be hospitalized. You have to be taken care of. Um, and for a period of time until you recover. But if you have a strong ego, you can get through it and you can continue uh, to live for the future and contribute to the future and do valuable things uh, for yourself and the, the world around you. So, yes, a, a strong ego is something to be highly prized. It's not at all a bad thing. A big ego, that's what that mm -hmm. usually refers to as somebody who's so full of themselves, they're inflated. Uh, they're identified with the archetypal energies or something. They're unrealistic about themselves. Uh, they want to dominate everybody. You know, they're narcissistic. That's what, in, in the common uh, vernacular, it's called, you know, we refer to as a big ego. In analysis, for me, I think one of the biggest things I learned is that I am human and what it means to be human. Um, so, that was very helpful for me. Okay, is there anything else you'd like to cover? Well, um, I can't wait to see the rest of the um, releases. Um, and uh, as they come out, maybe we can do some more reflecting on them. Yes, I hope so. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, Dr. Stein. And uh, I look forward to speaking with you again soon when the next song is released. Thank you. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J U N G dot com, for more information on this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, including episode 42 on Jung's Map of the Soul, and episode 44 on Map of the Soul Persona, which are all available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And you can also listen on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts or TuneIn. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. So with special thanks to all of the members and support staff of BTS and to the BTS Army, this is Laura London. And you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. <laughs>